I've traveled the country these last seven or eight months, a whole bunch. And you see parents reclaiming their rightful place in the education of their children. They're doing it both directly with their kids, making sure they're looking at what their kids are studying, reading, going to the school, seeing what's in the library at their school, all, all the things that parents need to do. But importantly, too, they're coming to see that, you know, we, we always talk about presidential election, that who's my senator going to be? I think they've come to see that who their city council is, who their county commissioners are, who sits on their school board, who are the, the, the board of regents for their particular state, who make decisions on curricula and on teacher hiring and all the things that go into shaping what the, the classroom experience is going to be like. And you see parents having a real impact there. Uh, you know, my, my view is kids ought to have a choice to go to school wherever they want. But some parents are, are in these public schools and they need to know that the people who are making decisions about what their children are going to be taught have a value set that is consistent with theirs. It's not that we shouldn't present lots of different ideas. Sign me up for a diversity of ideas being presented, but they need to be presented just as such. But what we should do is math and reading and teaching. And, and the, the idea the idea that somehow we're going to teach that this country was founded on an, a racist I, ideology, this, uh, this presents real risk to our nation, not only to these families. What's doing, everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guest on the podcast is the former director of the CIA and former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Mike Pompeo is returning for a second interview here on First Class Fatherhood. I'm tremendously honored to have him back on the podcast. Last time he was here, he was the acting Secretary of State. Uh, today's episode is being brought to you by My Pillow. Everybody and anybody out there has canceled Mike Lindell. I have not. If you'd like to help support the podcast here and get the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, get over to MyPillow.com and at the checkout, use the promo code FATHERHOOD and you are going to save up to 66% on your entire order. All right, so you can find the link to the MyPillow down there in the description below. While you're down there, tap the like, hit the subscribe button, and let's jump into it right now with Mike Pompeo on First Class Fatherhood. Joining me now, First Class Father, former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Welcome back to First Class Fatherhood. It's great to be back with you. I hope you're having a good day. I am. You know, it's funny, the last time I regret not asking you, uh, I interviewed you here while you were the Secretary of State. I would have loved to have had a snapshot of your itinerary that day, like, it, you know, <laughs> meeting with Ambassador so-and-so, lunch with the Vice President, call with Alec Lace. You know, I would have loved to have had that little <laughs> snapshot there. I'll send you a copy of that day's schedule. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, the last time we did talk, I asked you uh, what kind of uh, dating advice you gave to your son, Nick, over the years. You have some good news here. Nick is uh, engaged now. Congratulations on that. Uh, what kind of, if any yet, uh, marriage advice have you given Nick? Oh, my goodness. I haven't given him a whole lot yet. I hope I gave him all the skills he needs uh, as, uh, as he moves forward to be a good Christian father, to, uh, to be patient and loving. All, all the things that uh, good husbands and good fathers do. I, uh, I'm, I'm told I'm not even allowed to talk about my future grandkids just yet, um, but I am so excited. Uh, they're getting married in the summer of this year uh, to a lovely young woman who named Rachel, who we just uh, enjoy her and her family. So we're very happy for Nick that he's found someone that he loves and someone who loves him as well. Yeah, very cool. Well, you must have done something right. You must have given us some good advice over the years there. So uh, now you talk about, you know, maybe future grandkids and stuff like that. Right now, uh, Mr. Secretary, it is a scary time for parents in this country here with so much going on. I wanted to touch on just a little bit of it. And one thing that's been circulating on social media is an older video of uh, Melissa Harris Perry talking on MSNBC. And she said her quote was, we have to break through this sort of idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and realize that kids belong to whole communities. Uh, obviously, people on the left defending this, people on the right saying this is absolutely insane to say something like that. What's your take on a statement like that? So I saw that clip and I am confounded how a human being created an image of God could, could, be, could in, in, in any sense be owned by a community. <laughs> We have a responsibility as parents, right? We have our, our responsibility as a father, as a mother, is to protect and nurture and educate and uh, instill the value set in that in that young person as they mature through life. Uh, we look we we looked for lots of help from our community to help raise Nick. He had a a, a great young man who was his mentor at church. Uh, there were his some of his teachers were fantastic, but the responsibility. <laughs> The responsibility to raise Nicholas to be an outstanding uh, human being and a good American citizen fell directly to Susan and to me. 
Very well said. And yeah, and I, I think we're seeing this push to kind of separate kids from their parents. I know now for one, this uh, poisonous ideology has been in the college universities for a long time now. We see kids coming out hating America. They all want to be activists and stuff like that. But we're seeing this stuff now play out on the elementary school level. It's gotten down that far. I even had um, a Dr. Ben Carson on the podcast here. We talked about the uh, critical race theory uh, being introduced to these kids at such a young age. They're teaching them about transgenderism in kindergarten and first grade. This stuff has gotten out of control. And if the parents say anything about it, they're told to stay out of the curriculum. You have no no say in the matter and that you're a domestic terrorist in this whole bit. How do we get this turned around uh, in these school systems and turned around quickly? I think it's happening. I think that there's nothing good to say about the Wuhan virus, but it did expose a whole lot of parents to what was taking place in their schools, parents who just hadn't had a chance to see that. Uh, I've traveled the country these last seven or eight months, a whole bunch, and you see parents reclaiming their rightful place in the education of their children. They're doing it both directly with their kids, making sure they're looking at what their kids are studying, reading, going to the school, seeing what's in the library at their school, all, all the things that parents need to do. But importantly, too, they're coming to see that, you know, we, we always talk about presidential elections and who's my senator going to be. I think they've come to see that who their city council is, who their county commissioners are, who sits on their school board, who are the the, the board of regents for their particular state who make decisions on curricula and on teacher hiring and all the things that go into shaping what the, the classroom experience is going to be like. And you see parents having a real impact there. Uh, you know, my, my view is kids ought to have a choice to go to school wherever they want. But some parents are, are in these public schools and they need to know that the people who are making decisions about what their children are going to be taught have a value set that is consistent with theirs. It's not that we shouldn't present lots of different ideas. Sign me up for a diversity of ideas being presented, but they need to be presented just as such. But what we should do is math and reading and teaching. And, and the, the, idea, the idea that somehow we're going to teach that this country was founded on an, a racist I ideology, this, uh, this presents real risk to our nation, not only to these families. Yeah, great stuff. And I think to your point, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of parents woke up. I know for myself, when the kids first came home with that virtual training two years ago, and you're looking over their shoulders and you're kind of scratching your head, say, wait a second here. You know, I think a lot of parents were kind of like, wow, what this is what they're teaching you. So I think that did kind of wake a lot of the parents up towards it. But one thing uh, that is still bothering me to the core is the fact that my I have four kids myself that are in school, uh, two high schoolers, two in grammar school, and they are still being forced to wear masks here in New Jersey. And it drives me crazy. Now, to be honest, I got my kids the fake masks. They have these things. They're screened through. They can breathe through. And they provide just as much protection as a regular cloth mask does. But why in the world are we still masking our children? And when is this, if ever, going to stop? You know, I, I would have told you a year ago it was going to stop before too long. But I'm now convinced that these folks will have us wearing masks forever if they have their choice. This is now not, not based on science. I don't think there's anybody who believes that the, there are serious health impacts associated with children being in school without masks. I've not seen, I've not seen the study that demonstrates that. Uh, we know these young people are pretty darn resilient and we need to live our lives. And most importantly, this gets back to where we began the conversation, which is the people who should get to decide that are in fact the parents, <laughs> not the, the school board, not the state elected board of education, but rather the parents should make decisions for their own children and to to put these kids in masks, to ask them to play dodgeball, or maybe that's been banned, <laughs> thinking about my time in school, that to, to whatever it is kids do to go out and socialize and, and, and be part and to live their full lives, to force them to do this in masks is truly cruel. And the wild part about it, Mike, is that the, the people that are telling your kids to wear masks are constantly being filmed and recorded in public places, not wearing them. So we, we constantly see this from the leaders that are, are forcing kids to wear them. They're not living up to it themselves. So how are we supposed to take them seriously? Oh, you're, you're now, you're not, you now think that the progressive left is worried about hypocrisy. Come on. <laughs> they're, they're, they're way past that. Uh, look, it, it's, um, it, it's the case that individuals, we, we, each, we, we have, we have agency for ourselves and parents should be able to make good decisions for their children. And when they do, some will choose to have their children wear masks. So, so be it. Um, those parents that choose to have their kids not wear masks ought to be permitted to do that in the same way that we each ought to be able to make the right decision for ourselves about how we're going to respond to risk. <laughs> right? So, you know, we, all, we put COVID in this different bucket somehow. There are, there are risks we face 
all through life. And we, we need adults to reason their way through risk analysis. And we need those same adults to evaluate risk for their own children as well. Yeah, right on with that. I know you mentioned the uh, importance of having a school choice. I know we just finished with uh, school choice week. Uh, and as I mentioned, I have four kids. They go to different schools. I have uh, some in Catholic school. I have one going to a vocational school because they learn differently. Uh, I know that with my disciplining of them, they all receive di discipline differently. They all give and receive love in different ways. I think it's so important to have that. I know it's big with you and you are a supporter of it. Uh, what do the parents out there need to know? Why are you a big champion of uh, school choice? been supporting school choice for a long time, for 30 years now I've been working on this. Uh, sadly, in, in a lot of states, uh, New Jersey is probably one of them. It's, it's still pretty limited. It's harder. Sometimes it takes parents with means and resources to get their kids into the right place. There are two fundamental reasons. One, um, we shouldn't force our kids into crappy schools. And too many times the schools run by government just aren't very good. Frankly, that's most often the case in our nation's biggest cities. Right? They have the least capacity for these kids to learn. So we put some of our most challenged families in some of our worst schools. That's just not the way a nation that de depends on equality would operate. And so we ought to give every student an equal opportunity to go to a school that makes sense for them. Second, um, your point's exactly right. Kids just learn differently. And sometimes kids learn differently as they mature. So they might learn one way when they're eight, nine, or 10, and then a different school will be a better for fit for them when they're in middle school or in high school. We ought to give the parents the capacity to evaluate that for themselves and make sure their kids in a school that is best fit or at least a good fit uh, for themselves. We spend, an, we the American taxpayer, New Jersey taxpayers, taxpayers in Kansas spend an awful lot of money on education. We should make sure that those resources are well spent, that we reward teachers who are actually educating and that we give kids and parents the choice to go to a school that is a good fit for what their objectives are. Yeah, and definitely scary to see some of these TikTok videos of some of these teachers that are in charge of our kids. I mean, it's getting more frightening uh, by the day there on social media. But I wanted to turn this over to the military now, if I could, just for a second. Um, you being a former military member yourself, I interview a lot of dads on here who have served. Uh, what's happening in our military, besides being the woke, as it seems a lot of the military leaders are becoming, it, it seems as though now that they've put a, a you know, a stranglehold on some of these men and women that serve because they weren't vaccinated. And if they were vaccinated, they had to lose their positions. I know that was a challenge for some of the Navy SEALs. They've been arguing back and forth about that. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for the parent out there at this point in time whose kid is about to sign up or is considering sir, uh, signing up for a military career? Well, I must say, I still think this is an absolutely noble undertaking for those young people that choose this path for their life. Thank you. God bless you for choosing to serve in America's armed forces. In turn, the leaders, the people responsible for those armed forces have multiple responsibilities. One is to make sure that if we're gonna put young people in harm's way, that we do so with a clear mission that matters to the American people. Second, we need to make sure that we, we build the esprit and teamwork and focus the military on the mission set that it has, not the one that they wish it has. It's This is not a woke institution designed to create uh, a feel-good environment. This is a machine that is designed to protect America. We should treat it as such. I, I want to make sure everybody who wants to do this gets a fair and equal shot at doing it. And if they want to rise to the rank of staff sergeant or sergeant major or captain or what, so be it. Do it on the merits. What we, we shouldn't do to the military what we've done to so many of our other institutions is we reward things that are tangential, peripheral, or in some case work against the primary objective of the organization. And, you know, this issue with vaccines, I, I said the other day, uh, we, th these folks have willingly entered American service. We have an all-volunteer military, and they've done so at risk to their own lives. To tell them now that they're, they're, they can't evaluate risk for themselves with respect to the vaccine, some of them will have had COVID, right? Some of them will, will be, have antibodies that protect them from COVID. To allow them to not even consider that as a possibility for someone uh, is is really antithetical to the traditions of our military. I, I hope that cooler heads will prevail and that the next president, if someone is drummed out of the military with a less than honorable discharge uh, because they refuse to take a vaccine, that that next president will find a way to restore uh, that person's uh, either honorable discharge or if they want to come back inside to rejoin our United States military. 
Yeah, really well said. And thank you for your service. And I do. I have such a respect for the men and women that serve our nation. here. I don't think we stand a chance in this world without them. So uh, hopefully we see that morale always stay intact and picked up yeah, there man. with a with the members of the Air Force. Now, let me turn it back into you uh, as a dad here for a sec, because I wanted to bring something up. Uh, I talk on this podcast a lot about the fatherless crisis that we have going on in this country. I, in my opinion, I think it's the number one social issue we have. Uh, we have so many kids growing up without a father, father figure. Um, and, and one of the aspects of this is the blended families that we see sometimes making it difficult to work. And I know you came into your son Nick's life at a very young age, embraced him as your own. Sometimes that transition can be a very difficult transition for a lot of men, a lot of young dads out there. There. So what type of advice do you have to the young dad who's out there listening, who may be just on the onset of stepping into the role to embrace fatherhood for his spouse's child? You know, for me, Nicholas was my son, <laughs> uh, period, full stop. He, he was then, he is now. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, love him, love him with all the love you'd have if it was the child that, that had you'd been with forever. Nick was uh, eight years old when I first met him. Uh, I loved him from the moment I got to know him. When Susan and I got married, he was he was our son. I adopted him as quick as the state of Kansas would let me do so. Uh, but the, the the hard work of fatherhood comes from this unabiding love, this connectivity that says, you know, everyone messes up. Both the child and the dad <laughs> sometimes get it wrong. Uh, in the end, you you work through those things in a way uh, that shares the idea that you will protect and love them forever, no matter what it is they choose. Uh, and if you do that, if, they, if you give them that knowledge and then you, in my family, if you give them a grounding in faith as well, uh, then you'll be a good dad and you'll end up with a, a son who's prepared to be a good husband himself. And I pray one day my son will become a, a good father as well. Yeah, very well said. And you mentioned there the next president of the United States. I got to ask you here because it could skyrocket the ratings of the podcast here. Will you be <laughs> making a run at the presidency in 2024? Well, I hope I skyrocket the ratings today, but that's not how it's going to happen. <laughs> I, I am working hard for a lot of candidates across the country for this next election in November, and then we'll we'll see what the good Lord brings after that. Well, best of luck to you, whatever you do decide to do. I personally think uh, we would be a big benefit if you decided to run. So uh, love to see what you could. Do you have any other kind of uh, works in the progress? Are you working on any books coming out? Any other kind of projects? What kind of plans or goals do you have here for the future? You know, I've got a lot of things going on, one of which is I'm still working. I view the Chinese Communist Party as trying to undermine our families here at home, the very topic we've had today. And I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about how we can develop uh, an, an American strategy to push back against that threat. Well, best of luck with that. I know it's crazy to see so many people jumping the ship off of Spotify because of some controversial thing with Joe Rogan, but no athletes are banning, you know, withdrawing from the Olympics because it's in China. It seems like that's OK. Uh, but, you know, we see it on the other side. So uh, I don't know what's going on with all that. But, hey, it's been an honor to have you back on. God bless you. And thank you for your time on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you very much, my friend. I'll come back hey, when you're ready for me. You got, once you have that first grandkid, we'll bring you back on. <laughs> That'd be <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. So, uh, thank bye you bye. so much. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me on your show today. It's been a blessing to me. I hope everybody will enjoy listening to us.